I said to Dennis a few minutes ago that it's never happened to me before that like four days before I was going to talk about something, I encountered a book that completely kind of summed up what I was already planning to talk about. But I did, I did run into that book, and I put it on the, it's on the handout. It's called The Distraction Addiction. So the name of the book and the author is on the, is on the handout. Um, but the presentation that I'm going to do is actually something that I thought I thought up myself. That it, it's it, no, it's not. It's it, but it's a way of tying together some information about the way the nervous system acts and and meditation in in a particular way that I've kind of been putting this together for probably four or five years. I've been talking about these different parts, and uh, when I picked up this book, this guy really has all of those things put together in an incredibly terrific way and um, gave me permission, I think, to be much more direct with people in saying, you know, actually mindfulness, learning how to, to be mindful, learning how to figure out a way that you can take five or ten minutes a day to work with your breathing and settle yourself down, isn't, it isn't uh, uh, an outlier kind of an idea anymore and it actually isn't something that I think you can afford not to learn how to do. So for many, many years, I've been teaching. I actually taught meditation here at the College of DuPage for about 10 years. And uh, I was always kind of low peddled about, you know, this might be a nice thing for you to learn how to do. But this man is really making it clear that if we don't learn how to use our technology in a kind of a really, he talks about contemplative Contemplative computing is the thing that he's selling. And he says if we don't learn how to do it, we're going to um, be sorry. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to turn into just a completely distracted, reactive culture that isn't able to actually sit down and kind of settle into an idea. So I'm not going to try to cover everything in this book, but I told Dennis I would really love to come back next year and do this because it's just, it's, it's terrific. So, but I do want to do a couple of experiments out of, out of his book. So the first thing I want to do is ask you to just put everything down for a minute. And um, I'm going to use this bell and I'm going to hit it uh, twice. I'm going to hit it once just so you can hear it. And then the second time, I'm going to do a little activity with it. And what I want to invite you to do while I'm doing this is to close your eyes. And you can close them right now because I'm not going to do anything up here but talk. And so you don't have to see me. Part of what has happened, I think, with the use of technology is that we don't trust our other senses the way that we used to. We kind of feel like if we don't see something, somehow it doesn't exist. But I'm actually not, I actually am up here with my own eyes closed. Um, so I'm going to hit the bell once just for you to listen to it. Um, I'd like you to see if you can keep your attention only on the bell. And I'd like you to see if you can watch yourself doing that. So if you can watch yourself veering off listening and then coming back and, and observing yourself. So here's the bell the first time. So it has a really long sustain. Some of you people, some people probably are still hearing it. I'm going to actually put my hand on it and stop it. Okay. Um, so then this time, I'd like you just to listen to it and keep your eyes closed again. And then when you can't hear it, actually I'm going to hold it and stand a little closer to everybody. When you can't hear it anymore, then just raise your hand, okay? So this is just an experiment in really paying attention and listening, and there's no pass, <laughs> passing or failing. And different people, because you're different 
degrees of closeness to me are going to not hear it sooner. But just, just pay attention, see if you can hear it, and then just raise your hand when you can't hear it anymore. you. So doing that, listening, doing that listening, um, so were people able to notice when you came off the listening and then when you brought your mind back? How many people could notice that? Your mind kind of drifted away and then you came back? Okay. That's what I'm wanting to work today on trying to, to develop. That's called the observational eye. Okay. That's the part of yourself that watches yourself doing and thinking what you're doing and thinking. And so we all have that. Um, but it's not something that is particularly cultivated in our, in our culture. So we kind, of, we kind of, as I said, we're kind of up here, operating out of our eyes and what we see, and then just kind of reacting right away to whatever that is. I work with uh, student interns um, in the social work program. And so I, I see them every week and I said, you know, I'd like you to notice what's going on with you when you sit down with clients. So the clients that come to them are frequently kind of upset. And what I wanted them to start to notice within themselves is what happens to them when they are sitting with somebody that's upset? Do they, do they try to make the person calm down right away? Do they start to get upset? Do they start to get ideas like, oh, I wonder if this is going to be too hard, because these, especially these are students, I wonder if I'm going to know what to do. So we all have that. We all have that backseat driver, for lack of a better word, this, this, this second part of our cognition that's observing what's going on. And that's part of what I want to try to work on developing today. So I would like everybody that has a cell phone or a Blackberry or a whatever, just to take it out of your pocket and hold it in your hand for a minute. And then I want you to actually, it, how many people have a smartphone? Okay. So I actually want you to take a minute and I want you to check, I don't have a smartphone, I have a dumb phone. But if you have a smartphone, I'd like you to take a minute and check your smartphone. So check and see if you've got any new emails or if anybody's doing whatever they do, tweeting you or face gramming or whatever all that stuff is. <laughs> see, whatever, whatever it was that uh, Ellen DeGeneres did at the, at the Oscars, see if you, if you got that picture by now. Okay. And then this is what I'd like you to notice, everybody that checked it. Are you holding your breath? when you're checking it. Yeah, yeah. So this, there's actually, there's a name for that. There's a name for that. It's called, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the book. It's called like, it's, it's called like checking apnea. It's not checking. It's like computer apnea, computing apnea, something like that. People uniformly hold their breath when they turn on their, when they, when they pull up their email at home, when they go to look for messages on any of their devices, people actually hold their breath and they keep on holding it. I mean, eventually you will breathe, but it's, it's a, it's a volunt it's an, kind of an involuntary reaction that we have because we don't know what's coming. We don't know what's going to be on here. We don't know what kind of message is coming. Um, I was talking to somebody else about this, and they were saying it's, it's um, kind of the way you feel when the phone rings in the middle of the night, because unless you're of a certain age when your friends are all calling you in the middle of the night. But when you attain a certain age, your friends are not calling you in the middle of the night anymore. And if the phone rings in the middle of the night, right away you go, oh, because it's never someone calling to tell you that you won the lottery. It's just, it's not. It's almost always, you, you're afraid 
it's some kind of bad news. So I'm going to save you from computing apnea <laughs> for the next hour and a half by inviting you to turn it off. So turn it clear off, not just putting it on vibrate. Actually, mine tells me goodbye when it goes off. And then I'm going to invite you to put it away from you. So put it on the floor. Put it off your body. So the other remarkable thing that I learned in this book is that, and I won't ask you if you have this or not, but people actually have phantom vibration. So 87% of people who either carry their, their device in their, this pocket or up here believe that their device is vibrating when it isn't. And um, this man does a lot of, of explaining of um, the interface between technology and our, and our nervous system. And so he says th these are places where we have a very sense, we have a lot of nerves in these two places. And they come to respond, you know, they come, so they come to anticipate the vibration of your device vibrating, telling you something exciting is coming, even though it's going to then make you hold your breath. Um, so people, people have that kind of interface between their nervous system and their technology. And the other thing that people apparently do is a number of people, once again, I'm not going to ask, but a number of people sleep with their um, device under their pillow and their hand on it. And so there's also such a thing as sleep texting. And so people actually text in their sleep. And somebody will call them the next day and say, did you text me in the middle of the night? And they'll say, no, I don't remember. And then they'll look at their, at their phone and, or their whatever and find that they actually have been texting. So, so this is, all the, this is the, the first experiment, which is just to notice what it means to pay attention um, to really try to notice, even right now as I'm talking, wondering, is she ever going to get to the next slide? Or whatever, where you're partly attending to me and you're partly something is going on in the back of your head. Really am encouraging you to try to get in touch with that part and then notice yourself kind of going back and forth between those two things. So, yeah. so this is um, what we're calling this. Give me a minute. Um, and these are the things that we're going we're to talk about. We're going to talk about what mindfulness is, how do we pay attention. That's kind of what we just did. So there's a definition on the next slide of mindfulness. I'm going to talk about the fight, flight, and flee response and uh, what happens when we get stressed. So I'm going to talk about that part. And then the second part I'm going to talk about are moods. I'm really very... Um, high on this guy named Robert Thayer who did a lot of research on moods. He seems to be like the only person who did it. So I want to talk about moods as well and then just some of the strategies that we can use to get a little more in charge of our lives. So, and then we'll have time for questions. So mindfulness is awareness cultivated by paying attention in a sustained and particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So those are all the qualities that are, that are folded in to mindfulness. When you're being mindful, you're choosing. It's something that you're choosing. So I, when I was hitting the bell, I was really asking you to choose to listen to the bell and to not listen to the bell um, in a way where you thought you needed to do it better than anybody else, you needed to listen longer, whatever, just to, just in this present moment, there's just you and the bell. And John Kabat-Zinn says that we engage in systematically regulating our attention and energy, influencing and transforming the quality of our experience. So when we can bring all of our attention to a moment, we can transform that moment and then I really like that John Kabat-Zinn has added this. So it's in the service of realizing the full range of our humanity and our relationships to others in the world. So mindfulness has become a tech, really a technology, and it's, it's um, 
I don't want to say, it's marketed. It's marketed now. It's, it's marketed as a social worker. I probably get something in my mailbox every other day that's got mindfulness attached to it. It's become, it's become marketed for good cause. But a lot of times these second two parts aren't included with it, and I really always want to try to include that. One of the reasons I would like to help you become more mindful is because I would like you to be more fully human. And I would like you to be able to respond to those in the world that you're in relationship with in a thoughtful way, and that 100% of the time, that is going to have, in my opinion, a good result. 100% of the time, if I'm relating to somebody in a more mindful way, I am much more likely to hear them out. I'm much more likely to let them finish their sentence before I jump in with what my ideas are. I'm much more likely to attend to everything about them, not just what they're saying, but to attend to their body language, to attend to their emotional coloring. And I'm much more likely to be the human that they are needing in that moment. So it's really important because mindfulness, I think everybody knows, mindfulness practice comes from out of Buddhism. And in Buddhism, that was its intention. Its intention wasn't to help us relax, really. And it wasn't, um, even though I'm not criticizing that, and, but it was also, it wasn't also, its main point, really, was to help us reduce suffering in the world. And so I really, I just wanted to put a pitch in for that. So, yeah, we can, I can. So, how many people are familiar with the fight, flight, flight, fight, fight, flight, freeze? I wrote it wrong. Fight, flight, freeze is the third one. Are, how many people? Okay, so that's a goodly number. So, we have two nervous systems. They, they are, they are uh, kind of parallel. Once again, I'm not a scientist. I was to say that. This is kind of like a cliff notes about fight or flight. But we have, we have two, two nervous systems that run parallel to one another. One of them is to engage us in these activities, to fight, to run, or actually to freeze. So the third one is freeze, and we don't, we don't remember that as much. We tend to talk about it as the fight or flight. But actually, the freeze is really, I think for humans, probably one of the most important things, because as, a, as, as we have moved, as we've become kind of more and more advanced human beings, we don't fight or run away as often. So when we were, you know, 10,000 years ago, when we were living on the savannas, we needed this nervous system. We needed it to work really fast, and that's what we did. We tried to kill something, or we ran away from it. And that, those were kind of the two main things that we did. But definitely, the third thing that it does is to shut, shut down, shut off. And with, with us now, it's much more likely when we, that system gets aroused in us that we don't do, that we, that we freeze. And so there's some thought that when people have a depressive disorder, that that's really what it's the result of. It's a result of over and over and over again, this system getting stimulated and there not being an activity that you can do to, to mediate it, to get, to get rid of all the chemicals that have, have gotten turned on. So the, um, the system turns on and people can remember. I'm actually having <laughs> quite a few, I'm having myself right now, uh, several experiences of the fight or flight. So if you came up here, you would find my hands are a little cold and that my mouth is a little dry. And um, my heart was, was kind of beating, now it's kind of calmed down. So I had really a fair amount of, of my, uh, my fight or flight thing was going before I started. I was standing here and I was saying, oh my goodness, you know, you're really nervous about this. So, and it was automatic. You know, I didn't, I didn't say, I think I'll make myself really nervous. It's, it's very automatic and it can be triggered by real or imagined threats. I was talking about, um, to somebody about finding parking, so I came over here a little early. 
And uh, all the students from COD, half of them, half of them were out there looking, waiting for another person to leave so they could pull in their parking place. And then I think there was some kind of fire drill in the middle of all that. And uh, I was having imagined threats out there, and the imagined threats, it was quarter of 10. Surely I knew I was going to get here by 11 o'clock. <laughs> but I'm driving around, oh, I'm never going to find a parking place, and you know, I should have thought of, I should have parked someplace else, and blah, blah, blah. So, so that, that got that system um, going inside of me. And then I said, now come on, take a breath and practice some of what you teach. <laughs> that would help. It has both physical and cognitive result, uh, results. So when it turns on, we have a lot, all this physical stuff. Our mouth gets dry, sugar gets dumped into our bloodstream, our heart beats faster, our blood pressure, our, our um, blood vessels contract, so our blood pressure goes up. And then we have a lot of cognitive things that happen as well. And they are all preparing us to take action. So. Um, this can become a habitual response. And part of what, the, once again, part of what this man talks about is he actually starts the book with a, an experiment that I don't think was a little bit disturbing to me. But anyhow, it, was, it involved a monkey that had some electrodes implanted in its brain. And this monkey was actually able to make a robot be immobilized, make it walk. And actually, the robot was 5,000 miles away. So he was doing it through a computer. And his point was that actually tools, and then he goes on in another chapter to talk about the way that tools become wired into our hands. One of the examples he uses is when you see a blind person, and they, they're using a cane to give themselves auditory. That, that cane actually becomes a part of their, of their central nervous system. People, uh, pilots will talk about that, this. The way that the controls in a plane actually are, are a, an extension of their hands. They actually sense things um, through their hands that, um, that we wouldn't. If we put our hands on there, we wouldn't feel that. But they completely interface with that. And so that's why you hold your breath when you pick up the phone, because the phone has actually, and the messages coming in, have become a part of your nervous system. So does that make sense to people? OK, all right. So yeah. So then what happens when, when this happens, when this whole system gets turned on? So all these physical things happen. These are the cognitive things that happen. Our thinking speeds up, so we start thinking faster and faster. Our field of awareness tunnels down. And so if you've ever been, probably the most, one of the most vivid experiences that people will have of this is if you have some kind of a near auto accident. And so what people will notice if they, if they start spinning on ice or something is all of a sudden, there's really nothing existing except inside the car. There's really all that's, that is really that you can perceive is inside the car and you and the steering wheels. So, our whole field of awareness literally just tunnels down. We're really not able to even perceive sometimes things that are in the periphery. Um, we are less able to develop new and unique responses to a situation. And we fall back into old responses. And so uh, one of the examples that I, that I always use with this is when you've had a family that has had an experience of domestic violence. And that had become an automatic response between a pair. So there had been an automatic way that things would escalate, and it would result in, in domestic violence. And then they went and got some kind of treatment, and they learned some new skills, and everything calmed down. And they became a pair that was able to manage their stress in a completely different way. Sometimes. 10 years later, 10 years after this whole event happened, a lot of stresses will happen to a pair. Somebody will lose their job. One of, something terrible will happen to one of their children. That their, their stress system will be overwhelmed. And all of a sudden, that maybe not that actual event, but the nearness of that event, that the husband, who is usually the person that's being aggressive, 
will find himself back all the way back there. And sometimes people will even actually be able to say that. They'll say, you know, I found myself back in some kind of, of old experience. And what it is, is that the brain is so stressed that it's going all the way back to some, something that you wired in at some time that was useful for you, that same, it felt like it was saving your life at the time. And so you fall all the way back into that old response. So this package, and this really is, if you, once again, if you observe yourself, you'll see um, that this is a, is a package of things. These things all happen. They happen simultaneously. They happen very quickly. And the reason that they developed that way was because that was a way we could save our lives when we were, when we were developing evolutionarily, we were developing this system. We wanted to be able to just focus on what was right in front of us, um, think really fast, what do I want to do, how do I want to get out of here, Not, and then go back to the tried and true. So once again, this was really, really helpful when um, we were needed to run up trees, but this isn't helpful at all right now. And this, this system gets stimulated often, and it's, it's, not, it's not useful for us. So we want to learn a way to get around that system. So I think it's time for another experiment. Is it? Yes, it's time for another experiment. OK. So now I'm going to teach you a little bit about mindfulness and about um, breathing. And I had a cartoon that's really cute, and I just simply was not able to cut and paste this cartoon over and put it in my PowerPoint, but the next time I will. And what it shows is a group of people sitting in a circle, and um, there's clearly kind of a guru guy sitting there. And uh, one of them is turning to the other people, the participant, and she said, I had no idea breathing was so complicated. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I am not going to teach you complicated breathing right now. I'm actually, later on, I'm going to teach you a little kind of breathing that has a little more whistles and bells. But all I want you to do right now, and I'm going to actually drag up a chair. So I'm going to do this sitting down so you won't feel like there's anything to look at at all, because I'm just going to be doing exactly what I'm asking you to do. So I'm going to ask you to sit in the chair. And once again, if you've got anything in your lap, just put it on the floor. And uh, you want to sit in, John Kabat-Zinn calls it an upright, dignified position, and you know what that means. But what he's saying is, um, part of what he's saying is, you know, his focus really is humanity, that we do embody dignity, that we don't, you know, need to be slumping over or whatever, you know, that we just need to be happy that we're, that we're here and that we're alive. You want to have your feet uncrossed. You want to have them just both on the floor. You want to uh, have your hands resting here. If that feels uncomfortable, you can certainly fold them. But um, there's something that probably works out a little better, having them here. And That's all you need to worry about as far as your sitting is concerned. So you can close your eyes. We're going to do this with our eyes closed. And I'm going to talk you through this. We're going to spend about, altogether, maybe about seven to ten minutes doing this. And all we're going to be doing is watching our breath. We're not going to be trying to change our breath. There's no special way to breathe. We're just going to be watching our breath. And we're going to be noticing that the mind has a tendency to stray off watching the breath. And then when that happens, we're just going to come back to the breath again. So that's, that's going to be the whole thing. I'm going to give you some instructions about the finding the breath, but that's going to be the whole thing, is just watching the breathing, kind of working on that part of the brain 
that is an impartial observer that just watches. It's kind of like a part that if you were sitting down by Lake Michigan on a beautiful summer afternoon and there were some waves coming up and splashing on the beach and then rolling back out again. And you were just sitting there. You didn't have to be anywhere. You didn't have to do anything. You were just sitting there watching that. That's the kind of attitude that we bring to watching the breath. So I'm going to hit the bell and start just giving some directions. And there's nothing else you need to do right now. Just listen to my voice and watch your breath and leave everything else that's outside of the room, outside of the room. So you want to start by finding the place where the breath is the most obvious to you. So what's happening is as you breathe in, your lungs are expanding. And therefore, your rib cage expands, your belly expands a little, your shoulders lift up. And then when you breathe out, all of that contracts, so the lungs empty and the rib cage comes in a little. And so it's as though we were in a balloon in our chest that was just filling up a little bit and then emptying back out. So see if you can find a place in your body where that activity of the breath is the most vivid to you. So it could be the rib cage. It could be the waistband of your pants. For some people, it's actually the feeling of the air coming and going from the nostrils. So just take a minute. See if you can find a place where the breath is the most vivid to you. And then that place is like home base. And so that's the place you're going to watch the breath. Once again, not to change it. You're not trying to breathe any particular way. You're just watching the breath coming and going. And that place in the body where you feel the experience of the breath is where you watch it. And then after about 11 seconds, your mind will stop. It'll drift off that. It'll stop watching the breath. It'll think about something in the room, something in the past, something in the future, maybe a sensation in the body, a sound. And when you notice that your breath drifted off, just bring it back. Bring it back to home base. Just sitting there watching the breath come and go. Then you just want to notice again what your mind is doing. And so it just becomes a, a habit, noticing that your mind drifted away, and then just bringing it back. 
not with any criticism, just coming back to noticing. For most people, after they've been watching the breath for a little while, it settles. It's a little slower. And just notice again if your mind drifted off, just bringing it back. And just take your time opening your eyes. Could you feel how, how the energy in the room settled? People feel that? There's a kind of a, a stillness that happens when a, lot, when a whole lot of people all together at the same time kind of just come into the present and breathe. And, uh, any play, I mean, sometimes people will do this in a room with like a hundred people and you, you still, you feel that, and there's a name for it, entrainment. It's a thing that happens when a lot of people in the room are doing the same thing at the same time. And it's just, you can just feel that settle. So what was that like for people doing that? What did you notice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But did other did that happen to anybody else? <laughs> so so what was that like? What was that like? Frustrating. Frust it was frustrating. It 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 is you know I think one of the things that we think is, and sometimes when you ask people what do they think meditation is, they say making your mind be blank. I've been meditating for more than twenty years, and my mind is never blank. <laughs> It, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think people really need to hear that. I, I do think that, that the quality, I think if you did a real-time, a functional MRI on my brain, when I started, the year that I started meditating, and you did it now, you would see the quality of that, of that um, going back to habitual thinking you would see the quality of my autopilot has diminished. You would, that would be different. And I think the amount of thoughts that I have would be different. So the number of thoughts that I'm generating, I think, might be different. Sometimes, <laughs> frankly. Not, not all the time, but, but some of the times. And uh, there's a lot of research that's been done with um, monks from Tibet, or the, in the Tibetan tradition, where they they are very, very, very um, strong. I mean, they go in, in caves and they have a lot of different things that they do in there, a lot of different kind of practices they do. And there's been a lot of very, very interesting stuff that they've done with real-time MRI with them. But that's not me and that's not you. Um, but I want to assure you, because I, I really, really, really want to encourage you to experiment with this technology. And I'm gonna, so this is like my public service announcement and I'm gonna make it three or four times before I'm done. You can download stuff off YouTube. There is an app, I've got it. I think I give the name of it in, my, in the handout. There's a number of apps that you can get. 
um, that you can just turn one of these things on and do this for 10 minutes and you can do it for 10 minutes twice a day and I guarantee you if you do it for even two weeks you will notice a difference in the quality of your life. If you do it for eight weeks, which is kind of the standard of, of most classes, um, when I used to teach this, people would find a, two, a 20, um, not a 20 percent, a 20, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble with word finding, their blood pressure would go down 20 degrees. Are they call them degrees? Whatever they call them. Yeah, yeah, points. so points, 20 points. Um, and, and uh, you can go to the bank on that. So I'm not saying you have to go to a cave or that you have to go to a retreat. It definitely works better for people if they do this with other people, partly from what you just experienced, because there's something that happens in a room when you're, when you're meditating with two, even two or three other people that does not happen when you're in, listening to YouTube in your car. But I'm saying you can listen to YouTube in your car and uh, it would be worthwhile. So anyhow, that's, so th that's the first experiment of this. So I want to talk a little about mood. So, so this is what we just did. Um, I'm going to do, th these are, never mind. <laughs> I'm going to do these later. <laughs> anyhow, these are, these are three different ways that we can do breathing. And they allow us to unhook from our automatic nervous system. So I didn't know where to put that, and I put it there. But anyhow, let's go on to moods. OK, I'm in a bad mood. Has anybody ever said this? <laughs> today. Somebody said it even today. So did I. I said it in the parking lot. No, I wasn't in a bad mood. I said, I'm real reactive. Um, so wh when you say you're in a bad mood, what do you? I'd be interested in hearing just a couple of people, what do you think you mean? What do you think is going on with you when you are in a bad mood? How do you know you're in a bad mood? Negative thoughts. Negative thoughts. What? Grouchy. 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 What else? Nothing is good. Stress. 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 Nothing is good. Yeah, so you have this all or nothing thinking that happens that says nothing is good. Everything is rotten. I, part of what I'm trying to um, in, I guess uh, encourage you to investigate the next time you're in a bad mood is that there actually is a physical component to a bad mood and there is a cognitive, there's a mental component to it. We are more likely to say the mental, we're more likely to say I'm mad, everything sucks, so we're more likely to kind of express the, the, the cognitive part of it. But if you really tune into your body, you're going to notice that there's also a physical component to it as well. So there was this man named Robert Thayer. He was on a college, he was a college professor, so he was in a perfect place to do some kind of research. You may have noticed that m many people who do research are college professors because they just have unlimited research subjects. So he did research. He noticed that mood really after kind of a, a psychiatric diagnosis Mood is actually kind of the second most important thing in how our lives go on. So he really thought it was interesting that people spent a lot of time studying psychopathology, but that nobody had ever really studied mood in any kind of a, a systematic way. So he began to study it, and he began to study it by, there's a questionnaire, and it's actually on the third <laughs> part of part of your handout and I actually I tried to put it on a slide and I couldn't get it shrunken down enough to get it onto the slide but you'll see it's just a little there's five quest, there's five states that have to do with tired to energy and there's five state five uh, words that are describing calm to tension and so he had the students carry a card with these variables and check themselves many times a day and then, and I, can we have the next slide? So then he developed this two axis model of mood and the first time that I encountered this, I just thought this was the coolest thing. I probably, in the particular family therapy thing that I um, studied in, we have a fall um, 
presenter who comes out here from Washington every year. And he probably brought this Thayer stuff, because it's about 20 years old now. This study that Thayer did is old now. <coughs> so I probably encountered this 10 or, 10 or 15 years ago. And I just thought it was so cool um, that I've never, I've just always hung on to this because I can observe this in myself. And the fact that it has these two axes, I think, is what makes it unique. So one of them is physical, and that's tired to energy. And then the other one is cognitive, and that's calm to tension. And so the interface of these two together give you these four different energy states. Calm energy is actually what you had a taste of a minute ago when you were meditating. So calm energy is the state that people get to in meditation. So a lot of people, when they're first learning to meditate, go to sleep. But after, I mean, it's just, it's frankly because in, as a culture, we don't ever pull the plug. And so sometimes when people have that first experience of just disconnecting from their monkey mind, they just, <laughs> you know, I, when, I used to, when I used to teach this over at, you know, at C here at COD, um, there would be some people in the class, because we would do what we did here, except we would do it for ever increasingly longer times, and there would be some people that just, they just were out immediately. Um, and it's because that they're running at a high level all the time, and they don't know what it means to just be still. So there's calm energy. Then there's tense energy, which is frankly the way that probably most people were when you came in here, to, or before you came here today. So people are, their energy is pretty high, but their cognition is getting a little more revved up. And so I think when we think of people like a type A personality, they're kind of tense energy. Calm tiredness is what hopefully we feel at the end of the day. So it's what we feel, if we're lucky, before we go to bed. Everything is kind of calmed down, and we're also, our body is tired, and we're ready to go to sleep. Tense tiredness is what I call the hell realm. So tense tiredness <laughs> is what every mother of a two-year-old knows arrives at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's, this is when people are really physically tired. They're, they're, it's towards the end of the day. Their energy is running out. But they're still, their minds are still really, really revved up. And it's a very, it's a very, very uncomfortable feeling because you, cognitively, you keep feeling like you're supposed to be doing something and you just don't have the energy to do it. So can I have the next? Um, so we engage in a number of different kinds of strategies <coughs> to try to change our mood. And what we're trying to change is we're trying to go from that lower corner from tense, tired, and we want to go up to calm energy. And so these are the ways, these are ever increasingly unhelpful ways of trying to change our mood. So active mood management means that we, that we close the door to our office and we put on a five minute, 10 minute YouTube or whatever thing and we just work on actively managing our mood. We say, I'm in a bad mood right now, I'm really tired, if something has really irritated me, and, I, and they, you close the door, and you actually manage your mood. So you do that, or you exercise. So the other thing, and that's the other thing that you're gonna hear me really trying to promote, because it's the other thing that really helps us um, dampen down the effect of the um, fight and flight response, is to exercise and actually burn off all of those um, adrenal uh, motivated chemicals. So I'm really having a word mining problem and I'm sorry, I just lost all my words. So that's active mood management. The second is seeking pleasurable activities and distractions. And this would be to, to, um, to do that physically. So that might be just getting up and, and walking around or going, looking outside or or, um, you know, possibly maybe playing computer games, people when people do that kind of thing. I, and honestly, I think that probably getting on your cell phone in a random way, probably, see, it, it was I, part of what I was thinking about when I was doing this is that he, this, 
he did all of his research long before any of this technology was here. And I just wonder how, where he would put things now on, on this graph as far as that. But I would say that, that that's part of where um, texting people and what have you is there. Part of that's distracting. Withdrawal and avoidance is thinking you've made me be in a bad mood. I'm in a bad mood because of you or because of this work situation or because of something. And I'm going to withdraw from that. You know, I'm going to go and, and if, it's, if it's a pair of people, one of them is just says, you know, I'm going into another room right now. Or I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to withdraw. Um, the fourth one is social support, ventilation. And it's very funny. When you read about ventilation, it, it means actually like when people cry really hard or they're, they're sobbing or they're, they're kind of screaming. So they're actually getting rid of some of, once again, kind of the emotionality connected with their mood. Um, social support means going and, and talking, you know, going and talking to somebody, calling somebody up on the phone. Uh, probably texting somebody and specifically talking kind of about what you think your bad mood is related to. And um, gratification then is the beginning of these bottom three which involve eating, you know, maybe getting a cup of coffee and that also goes down into passive mood management. So he has he has a couple of things that go back, I would say, go back and forth between those two. That would be like watching TV, eating sugar, drinking coffee, uh, drinking other caffeinated things, smoking, smoking cigarettes is passive mood management. No, I won't ask, but, but one of the, I was going to ask, it's just so odd to run into people who smoke cigarettes these days, but one of the most interesting things I ever read about nicotine is that nicotine is the only drug, it is the only drug that brings you up a little when you are down and brings you down when you are agitated. So it is the only, it, you, it, lets, it allows you to just modify briefly, you know, this passive mood management just to, to, in a very small way, it's not like ingesting some other kind of drug that has a huge result, but this is just bringing your mood up a little and bringing your mood down. And it's why it's so very, very, very difficult for people to stop when they, when they stop. And uh, it's, it's why uh, sometimes you'll run, <laughs> you'll run into people who have quit smoking. And it's like they'll kind of, I don't know that they directly articulate this, but it's like, I didn't actually know real life was like this. You know, this is actually kind of what unmediated life is like. Sometimes you're irritated, sometimes you're tired, sometimes you're, you know, so you kind of, we, this is how we go through our life. I mean, honestly, you know, we're kind of like this, you know. We're, some, our energy's up a little and then it's down and we get some bad news and we're down here and then we run into somebody we like and so that's actually what life is like. But um, we, <coughs> excuse me, we think that, um, it shouldn't be like that. You know, we think that it should be somehow, we should make it be like this. And so we engage in these things. And then direct tension reduction is actually um, trying directly to change the feeling state of your body. And so that is drinking alcohol and taking drugs and actually having sex. And so those things are where, and I'm not saying that that's the only reason that people have sex, but, but people, P that is a way that you can actually change your feeling state. So these are ways that people directly want to change how they feel right now. Um, and when you look at, the thing that was so interesting to me in looking at this, so one of the things that Thayer then went on to do was to, to do another book in using this model to help people lose weight. So what he helped people see was that um, much compulsive eating is related to people trying to manage their moods. And so um, if you could get a handle on your mood and the way that you were using food, you could, you could change your relationship to food. So, but the other thing that, that was really clear to me is when you think about drugs and alcohol, you can see that people are directly trying to, with cocaine, 
they're trying to go from being tense and tired to being to get over and to energize. When people are using alcohol, they're trying to get to that calm, that calmer state. When people are definitely when people are using marijuana, that's what they're trying. They're trying to chill. That's what they say. I just want to chill out. So you can see that if you were dealing with people who had a problem with addiction, that helping them, and this is once again why mindfulness is, is so prevalent in, in treatment now. One of the ways that you can help people deal with trying to um, stop using any kind of a substance is to develop that observational eye, is to learn how to notice what's going on inside of me right now. What, what's my auto, going back to that autopilot, what's my automatic response? Oh, in the past, whenever I felt like this, I had a drink. In the past, whenever I felt like this, I, I went and ate a candy bar or went and had a Starbucks. Um, and, but I've decided that that's not what I'm gonna do and so I'm, gonna, um, I'm actually going to make a different choice. But you have to be able to tap into that ability to observe what is going on to be able to make a different choice. So I think, do I have one more? I have, I have another experiment. So let me stop now and just ask what kinds of questions do people have just from everything that I've talked about? Let's see how much time we've got. Yes, we still have a half an hour, 25 minutes. People have questions? So when you talk about seeing yourself, are you really talking about envisioning yourself outside your body, looking back at your body? No. Okay. Were, you, were you able to notice your breath coming and going? Yeah. Yeah, it's that. It's just, it's, just, it's only that. Okay. It's, I mean, so that how many people, were people generally able to do that, mm -hmm. to find a place within your body? So that's the beginning of it. So, and then when your mind drifted off, then you notice that, right? So there was that, so that's the, the hard, <laughs> this is the hardest part to explain because I'm not a neurologist or anything like that. But, but I know well enough that, that these cognitive states exist. And so, so there is the part of your mind that drifts off. So there's that attention. That's really what that is, is the, the part of your mind that is observing, oh, I'm breathing, I'm not breathing. That's this kind of attention. And then there's another cognitive process that's watching that all the time. And so an observational eye, it's this kind of neutral part of our cognition. And it notices, it says in, in a way, you know, to this monkey mind or to this part that was watching, oh, you drifted off, come on back. So Jack Kornfield actually calls this training the puppy, so, because that's what you're doing is this, this um, attention, which I think is, is the function of this fight or flight response. So our attention is the part of us that is out here all the time, frankly, looking for trouble. So that's, that's um, I mean, not to get into trouble, it's looking for trouble coming to us. So that's the downside of, of evolution is that our central nervous system evolved in a way to keep us safe. That was its first, its first job. Its first job was, I want to keep you safe. I want you to notice right away if there's lions and tigers and bears in your near vicinity. I want you to notice oh, somebody from your group ate that mushroom and then they fell over and died. And so I want you to remember that mushroom. I don't ever want you to eat that mushroom again. And so th that, was, that was the first part of, of that d development of that system. Love, truth, beauty, and liking the flowers came later. You know, it came, I think it must have come after we had, had evolved some basic sense of security. Then, then we got religion and started burying people with stuff and, you know, I mean, you can really see that, that, that we had this other part of the nervous system for a long, long time before we developed any kind of culture. And so that's the part that's always out there. That's why you hold your breath when your cell phone rings, because the first part of you 
is expecting trouble. That's what it's looking for. Is there some trouble out there? That's, that's why people, um, you know, and once again, I, uh, there's a part of the brain that um, is, is more stimulated in depressed people, and that is the part that's out here looking for trouble. And so we have to actually try to work to enhance the other part of the brain. So that's a longer answer than you wanted, but that's, no, you're not, you don't need to be outside literally visualizing yourself, looking at yourself. You're much more noticing this breathing, noticing that the breath, that the attention drifted away from the breath, and then just bringing it back. And then what you'll start to notice when you do that is then you'll, you'll start to notice, and I'm sure people already do notice this, but you're standing in line somewhere. And so your body is standing in line, and your attention is noticing the line is moving up. But then actually you're, you're, another part of your mind is saying, I wonder if they'll run out before I get up there. Or, um, you know, if this line doesn't move faster, I'm just going to leave. Or, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on. And so what we want to try to learn to do is to be a better observer of that second part. So what John Kabat-Zinn says is that um, that that's what's running our life. <laughs> so this second part, this second uh, Cog this automatic cognition of moving around, thinking maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that, because we, we don't pay attention to it. That, that is running our mind. Most of the time, our life is us automatically responding to things in this old habitual way and not actually thinking, if you go all the way back to the definition in the beginning of mindfulness, we're, we're trying to become more attentive to the individual parts of our life. So we actually choose our life. So we actually decide, I want to do this or that, rather than just automatically doing the thing that has been the most comfortable for us, the thing that has been the easiest for us, the thing when we, when we respond to the people who are the closest to us in our life, we have a lot of automatic ways that we respond to them that are not especially skillful or useful. You know, we, we have a way of, of dismissing people or, or uh, automatically getting angry as soon as we hear a particular word. And so when you bring mindfulness into your life and you just, part of what you're doing is really slowing, slowing, your, slowing your thinking down a little, bringing that, that less conscious part up into the forefront so you can really attend to what, what you're doing. Other questions? Observations? Yeah. So, I noticed that you gave us the things up there that are supposed to take you from tense tiredness to calm energy. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself going in one of, falling more into one of the categories to alter your moods, would a new approach then be to try one of the other categories? Right, and it would be to try, so the way that they were listed, and they're, they're in more detail in the handout. I've got all six of them. So, the, yeah, I would be encouraging you to go, all the, go, to, go to the top. So I, would be in, I would be encouraging you to try to learn a mindfulness activity, and, and when you notice that your tent's tired, to take 10 minutes out to do that when you notice. So if you've always, if what you've always done is eat, no, and so, so I wanted to say a little, I didn't say this part of Thayer. So Thayer's research, what he ended up doing was then, after he had developed his model, <clears throat> was having people check their, you know, go through the questionnaire and check off what was their mood at the time. And then half of the group took a 15 minute walk and half of the group ate a candy bar. And what he found is that both groups got an immediate bump in, in energy. But the people who took a 15 minute walk, their bump in energy 
lasted longer and it declined much more slowly. Everybody in the room knows if you eat a candy bar or something like that, you are going to get this immediately bump, but it's going to be followed in about 15 minutes by a crash, and frequently people's energy goes back to even lower than it was before they ate the candy bar. So, um, so that's the other thing about exercise, is that exercise not only lifts your mood and isn't fattening, but um, the, the uh, energy that it gives you is maintained over a longer period of time. So yes, I would be encouraging you to try to learn a couple of those strategies. And then if you regularly are doing things down on the bottom, so if you find that you're regularly trying to manage your mood by, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I did drink some water here. If you're regularly trying to manage your mood by eating, or if when you go home at the end of the day and you're really tired, you just sit down in front of the television <coughs> and watch television for two or three hours, then, then even if you didn't move, if you didn't start meditating all the way, right away, but if you just moved up to social gratification and actually at the end of the day, instead of sitting down in front of the TV, you called somebody and talked for 15 minutes, or you... Um, Listen to music, and that's in the, in the handout. He specifically manages, mentions that. <clears throat> that's a way that people manage, I'm sorry, I'm just losing my voice here, that people um, manage their moods as well. So, other questions? We're gonna do one more experiment. Okay, we're gonna do another experiment, and then I'm gonna kind of go over the, the uh, suggestions on the handout in a little more detail. Okay. So we're going to learn a particular kind of breathing. I'm going to just drink a little more water here. So this is a four, this is called the four, four, six, two breath. So in it's mentioned on there. So, it's, I think it's mentioned on there. Um, I'm sorry, what did you call it? It's just, it's four numbers. Oh, okay. So, this is, this, is a, this is a counted breath. <clears throat> so, and so let me tell you a few things about this. So, I'm going to do this at a pace that works with my breathing. If, if I'm going faster or slower than your breathing, then just do this mm -hmm. at your own speed. And some people, and part of what this is going to do, part of what holding your breath for a count or two does for most people is causes them to yawn. So do not feel bad if you are yawning because actually doing this kind of counted breath um, results in people breathing more deeply. And that's actually one of the points, one of, the points of it. So if you're yawning, don't feel bad. And then there's a certain uh, small number of people that like counting breaths actually is, has a paradoxical effect. It makes, them feel, makes people feel kind of anxious or like they're gonna hyperventilate or something. So if you feel like that, just breathe normally. So just don't pay any attention to what I'm saying. Um, this actually has a physical thing that you do with it but I'm not gonna ask everybody in the room to do it because I just have a feeling that you, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to get everybody to get up and do this, so. But I'm gonna demonstrate it. So I'm gonna demonstrate that first, okay? So what the breath is, <coughs> is that you're gonna breathe into the count of four, you're gonna hold your breath for the count of four, you're gonna breathe out for the count of six, and then you're going to pause with the breath all the way out for two. So it's four in, hold four, out six, pause two. Okay? And the way that you do it physically, and so this would be a terrific thing to do when you're in a bad mood. So you're going to go one, two, three, four in, and then hold, 
one, two, three, four, and then out. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then all the way out, two. So I'm gonna do it, except I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna count out loud. That's, I recommend that. That's good stuff. I haven't, I haven't done it standing up before. Um, so you just try the breathing part, okay? So if you want to stand up, stand up. I just don't want to put social pressure on people to stand up. <coughs> okay, and I'm going <coughs> to, excuse me, I'm really sorry. This probably means that spring is coming. It's probably the good news about me. <laughs> okay, so, and I would definitely encourage you to just close your eyes while you're doing this, okay? So, breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, pause, two. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, pause, two. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, pause, two. Do it on your own. One more time. Okay. Thanks. So what was that like? What was that? That was nice. That was really relaxing. Yeah. Right. It's more focusing on my motion and my breathing. It gives me like a sense of clarity. It makes you feel very um, energized. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And part of that is that you're getting extra. It, it automatically, I could hear a few people yawning or coughing. It that there's something about holding the breath that causes that automatic um, nervous system to think, "Whoops, I better take in a little extra breath just in case there's not any more there." And so. It actually, this is, and, and there's several variations of this. If people have read, Andrew Weil has a variation, of, a slightly different variation of this. But any of the breaths where the, bre the out breath is longer than the in breath, and there is some element of holding, um, seems to, to provide all of that. It makes you breathe more. I could certainly, when I, especially doing the hand thing, you know, I just felt, it felt like the lights in the room changed is how it felt for me. I mean, it really, I really felt much clearer. So, um, it's, it's an immediate stress reliever. For right. Me. And I also find when I'm feeling not very well, mm -hmm. I, I stop and I, I work on my breathing and it actually keeps my blood Right, right, right. This, so this is, a, this is an easy, easy thing to do, yes. Does it actually do something physically in, in your body? Like, is there a physical change, an actual physical change? There, I, you know what, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that there's a resetting. I know that there's, so if you did this once again, 
and I didn't put Andrew Weil's book on there next time I'll put it. Andrew Weil has, people know Andrew Weil, he used to be on public TV all the time with a big beard. So he's a, um, an alternative doctor, an integrative doctor. And he has a book called Breathing and a CD. There's, it's a two CD set. And I'm sure, once again, I'm sure this is something that you can just downstream or download or something. Um, he has about six or eight different breath practices on there. And you absolutely can reset your physiology by doing breathing practices every day. And he specifically has some anecdotal information about treating people with anxiety disorder and panic disorder with breathing. So definitely, if you did this, if you did this, for, if you did this for 10 minutes instead of at some other kind of meditation, it would serve, absolutely, it would serve the same purpose. Yeah. So let me check the time. Yes, we have about 10 more minutes. So this other second breath I wanted to teach was, um, and I'll just go through this really quick, is three breaths and a smile. So that's what I had, I think I have on your list. Actually, can I get a copy of the handout and I'll just go. I'll go over some of the stuff in the handout. Yeah, so, so three good breaths um, and a smile is you want to, is just what it said. So I'm just going to go over these and if we, I, we're not going to try them. I'm just going to go over them. So you want to just do the breathing like we were doing, but you want to do three breaths. And before you start, you want to, uh, I, I would develop a, an image that you just well, can use all the time. So the image of someone that you love unconditionally. So um, frequently this is a parent or a grandparent, or if you are a grandparent, frequently it's a grandchild or somebody that you just love in an unreserved way. And uh, you want to be able to bring that person to your, to your mind. And so you take three breaths, and then you just bring that person to mind, and you send them a smile. So when you smile, there's uh, muscles up here that activate that that give you a little, kind of a little burst, the same way that that breathing did. So you want to do that. This is another stress thing you can do when you're, um, that you can just do very quickly. You could do this if you had to make an unpleasant phone call, you had to see an, somebody in a, something unpleasant. You could just do that. You could take three breaths and a smile. Um, taking a mindful walk, this is something that I just really encourage people to do. So this isn't, the matter of that, so mindful walking is just really being completely aware of your feet as they touch the ground. That's all it's doing. It, you just, you just the same attentiveness that you put on the breath, you just put on the, on your feet. So, and when your mind wanders away, you just notice. No, you know, left, right foot, left foot. So, um, going outside, just looking, looking around at what's outside. Looking for blue, so this is a great thing to do in your car. If you really got in your car and you were in a bad mood and you're upset about something, to turn off all of your devices and look out the window and see if you can find 25 blue things as you're driving to wherever you're going. You can also do it inside of a room. I was really upset one time in my sister's kitchen and um, I found way more than 25 blue things in her kitchen. And the other thing is, when you go out and you look for blue, then you see, oh, there's a guy back there in an orange shirt, and there's a, some green. And so you, once again, it brings you mindfully into the moment, into what's in your environment. Um, taking something in the environment as a clue to refocus. So for a long time, I had the old, <coughs> it's hard to, in an old phone, you know, that just had a handle on it, sat on my desk, and I had a green ribbon on the phone. And the green ribbon would remind me when the phone rang to just take a minute to get into the room and be present there and put down whatever else I was working on and be present to who I was going to speak to on the phone. There was a 
period of time that people did this with little teeny dots. You can get little teeny dots at um, Office Max or someplace like that. And people would just put them at somewhere, different places in their environment, in their car, in their office. And when they looked, so encountered the dot, that would remind them just to stop and refocus. Um, there's, there's an app for your phone or your tablet or your whatever um, that will play mindful bells every 15 minutes or randomly. This, this too is another thing that you can do where you have something outside of yourself reminding you, am I here? Am I here? Am I in my body? Am I in this room? Am I paying attention? Am I doing what I started out to do? I do this at home all the time. I set the timer for 15 minutes because I'm retired and I don't have a, exactly a fixed schedule. And I'll set a timer for 15 minutes and at the end of 15 minutes I say, am I doing what I thought I would be doing? Am I, am I where I want to be? Because it's really easy to get distracted. So the two best habits to cultivate you know what they are. You know. So develop some kind of a mindfulness, a breath, practice, and exercise. And when you look at the mood, the mood stuff, you can see that. These are the two parts of mood, the physical part. So take care of your physical body. And the mental part develops something that allows you to disconnect from, all, from your monkey mind, from all of those thoughts that are going on just under the surface that are saying, you're never going to find a parking place, you're never going to find a parking place, you know, you're going to whatever. Um, so those, both of those. Um, then the three things to do to, d to reduce techno stress, actually Time Magazine early in the month of February had mindfulness on the cover. And so I stole these from Time Magazine, so they, this was in there. Wear a watch. And I thought, that is a really good idea because you do. You take your cell phone out of your pocket all the time to see what time it is. So wear a watch, turn your phone off when you sleep, and keep it out of the bedroom, and uh, spend some time outdoors without your phone. Actually, the man in the red book suggests that re reconstituting some kind of Sabbath. So there used to be a time, people can remember, like on Sunday, everything was closed. You know, the stores were closed, and people went at a slower pace. So he isn't saying you have to do it on Sunday, but he is saying take a period of time where you don't have any technology at all, where you turn everything off. Um, so that's that. We have a couple, two minutes or something for questions. Any questions? So, you know, my basic, I, I think the basic, you know, thing, if, if there's a takeaway, it's that we live in a, in a time of distraction. And actually, one of the things I was going to invite people to do um, that was in the book is this man uh, sat down with somebody and they said, count from 1 to 10, and he did. And then they said, uh, say the alphabet from 1 to L, uh, A to L, and he did. And they said, now, say 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, you know, do that, that way. And uh, the other two things had each only taken him three seconds to do, but when he combined them, when he was going back and forth between the two tasks, it took eight seconds, so it was more than twice as much. And what that's about is how hard it takes, you think you're multitasking, you're not, you're not. Your mind is constantly bouncing back and forth between two tasks, and it's very ineffective. And so, Using mindfulness skills allows us to choose more often to stay on and do one thing and then to do it well. So, thank you.